Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or whatever you should happen to find this. This is Unsummon Skull, Jay Rowe, your host with the most. Are you ready for the 14th episode of the Coat of Arms podcast, where we bring a special guests to talk about their favorite tribes and magic? Our guest today is... AJ Mickey. Hello. Awesome, great, uh, great to have you. And where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at Twitter, at... JJ Mickey Media. That's with underscores between each word. That's on Twitter. Oh, I didn't say that. Sorry. And I'm on TikTok at the same. Um, TikTok's without any capitals. Twitter is with capital letters. All right. Great to hear. So, what tribe are we talking about today? Today we're talking elementals. Awesome. So, what are elementals like in Magic? Elementals are very varied, but they tend to focus on ETB effects, which are all over the place in what they do. Almost completely dependent on the color identity of the card itself. Okay, so let's begin with, so when you're talking about an enters the, uh, or the ETB effect stands for enters the battlefield. So yeah. when you cast the spell, the so when you cast a creature spell, it goes on the stack. When the creature spell resolves, it then goes on to the battlefield. And going onto the battlefield can have a host of triggers, and that's when this would that's when this would uh, go on the stack, correct? Yeah. So, what sorts of abilities would a or would would different colors have? Well, in green you'd have ram, like uh, uh, Avatar of Growth gets each player two basic lands from the deck, or you have your um, artifact and enchantment destruction from Bane of Progress, which destroys all artifact enchantments on the battlefield, which is a very much a green thing. In blue, you've got card draw, or, yeah, uh, you've got Cloudkin Seer and the evoke creature um, Ball Drifter is an elemental, which draws cards. There's black, which is does uh, black things like this card. Uh, one of the more prominent members is a uh, Shriek Maw, right? Uh, tear on a stick? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was one that saw a lot of play when uh, Lorwyn and Shadow... or when uh, Lorwyn and Shadow more block. Oh, really? Uh, well, yeah, because it was uh, a removal spell with upside, but it would also get brought back with Horde of Notions. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Horde of Notions is the commander of my elemental deck. Awesome. So I guess we can segue into... so. What does uh, Horde of Notions do? Horde of Notions is a Wooberg legendary elemental. It's a 5-5 with Vigilance, Trample, and Haste. And you can play Wooberg colors to play Tart Elemental from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. And that was... Uh, and so, uh, I think I mentioned before that my, my first ever uh, PTQ that I went to, I actually ran a 5-color elemental Horde of Notions deck. Yeah, you did mention that. What was that like? So we ran the Vivid Lands along with Reflecting Pool, and uh, so this was Block Constructed. But you could run a five-color elemental stack in Block Constructed because the Vivid Lands and Reflecting Pool provided a near-perfect mana base, uh, along with uh, a few other, uh, so along with Murmuring Bosk, I don't think was used, but uh, there was a land that, uh, was, I think a Czech land, uh, that worked with the elementals as well. Flamekin Harbinger, Smoke Breeder were nice as well. Oh yeah, I, I like those cards. So Flamekin Harbinger for a red allows you to find uh, basically as a tutor for elementals. And then the Smoke Breeder is uh, uh, it taps for two mana of any color but can only be used to cast elementals I believe. So, just the way to... Or activate abilities at all. Or activate abilities? Okay, I wasn't sure if it was both. Yeah. It's kind of like Somberwald stage, or Sage, I think. But yeah, it's the, that kind of super pump acceleration and fixing is awesome. And then being yeah. able to use the evoke creatures and then bring them back with the Board of Notions later for massive value was it was a big game. That sounds awesome. I won't have to go in uh, 5 and 2 with it. Commander deck. Oh, sorry for talking over you. Oh, no, it's not a problem. I wound up going 5-2 uh, and two with it. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. Funny, funniest tech was in the sideboard, I had a, uh, a, a goat napper. 
he managed to take a uh, Chameleon Colossus with it because Green Black Elves was the big deck, and mm. Chameleon Colossus was one of their big win conditions. So I was like, you know what, I'm not sure I can beat it because it's pro-black, so I can't take it out with uh, Shriekma. I might as well right. just put one of Goat Napper in the, in the, in the board <laughs> and see if it works. Because the Colossus is also a goat. So, Were there a lot of elementals other than the evoke creatures at that time? Um, it was mostly evoke. So it was the evoke creatures, the harbinger, the smoke raider, and the thing itself, and that was a lot of the deck. Mm, uh, I don't remember all of the ones that were used, but basically the, the idea of the deck was just to bury the opponent in repeated advantage like that. Yeah. Nice. Cloud Thresher was a big one too. Yeah, the kill all the flyers. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's in yours, but I love that card. Yeah. Um. I don't think I'm. I'm not running it currently, just because it's triple green, I believe. Mm -hmm. Tips. To cast, yes. Uh, I have been in my Simic Burn deck because it's too damage to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a good card. Mm -hmm. And with Flash, you can sometimes uh, sneak it in after a Wrath and just bop somebody for seven. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Especially with Horde of Notions, it's always nice to be able to evoke the creature. So Cloud Thresher evokes for only two green, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it's two colors and two green. So, yeah, I might, I might reconsider it for my elemental stack. It's because always good to have removal. incidental mass removal like that. Yeah. Plus a seven seven is nothing to uh, nothing to sneeze at, eh? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So talked a little bit about so some of the elementals with evoke. We talked about smoke raider. Talked about flame and harbinger. What are some of the other elementals that are in the deck? Um. Well, one that's like how we've been talking about the value of the elementals and their ETP abilities. Yark the Desecrator is a really valuable one. Oh, yeah. That's one of the cards people sometimes forget about its subtyping because it's usually just used as a value community. Right. And people also but it is an elemental. Yeah, people also sometimes forget that those commanders can be used for... can be used in the 99. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Omnaths. Oh, yeah, the Omnaths, so uh, it's... Uh, I only have Locus of the Royal, but I did used to have a Locus of Rage deck, which I, well, we're going to talk more about my personal stuff in a bit later, right? Yeah. So I'll hold on to that. Absolutely. But yeah, uh, yeah, I have on that Locus of the Royal because it's very much an Elementals deck as much as a Landfall deck. Mm -hmm. Synergize. Well, the card itself is very much Landfall and Elementals, not just... So what does um, uh, that, what does Locus of the Royal do? Uh, when ETBs, it deals damage to any target equal to the number of elementals you control. Okay. And when a land enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one plus one counter on target elemental you control. And if you control eight or more lands, draw a card. So it works with ETBs. It's a form of spot yeah. removal. It's a key yeah. form of card draw, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, it, does a, it checks a lot of different boxes. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's an elemental, but there's a creature that turns your creatures into forests. I wonder if that would, would, would be a good synergy with it. Uh, I think it is. I, I'm trying to look up. I just can't remember. I, it's like a Shia. Yeah. I don't know how to spell it, but I'm pretty sure it's an elemental. And yeah, that would be an interesting thing to work in as well. Yeah, a Shia Soul of the Wild is an elemental. So non-token creatures you control are forest lands in addition to their other in addition to their other types. And power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. So that could be an interesting one because it's an elemental. Um, it doesn't technically have an enter the battlefield ability, but when it enters the battlefield, it ch it changes the way that you look at your board. Right. Uh, it also allows your creatures to trigger landfall. I uh, think another... there's a combination as well with, uh, I think there's another forest-based uh, commander that came out recently that combos with, but I can't remember right now. 
There's another uh, bell muscle I really like. It's, it's also not an ATP feature, but it's PP Trailblazer. Oh, nice. What does that one yeah. do? Yeah. It's uh, other elementals you control get plus one, plus zero. And you can pay two red and green to give it plus one, plus one to end of turn for each elemental you control. Its base is a two, two, four red and green. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it can, it can super pump and get really big. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's always nice in a five-color deck to be able to turn that corner and become aggressive. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, five-color decks sometimes tend to get caught dirtling or trying to fix their mana and such. So, how do you offset the difficulties in mana in a five-color deck? Well, what I'm planning to run about all of the uh, plans that tap for any color, your uh... Man Towers, your City of Brasses, Exotic Orchards, so on, all the Triomes too. And I've got I've got a few quite a few mana dorks, even if they aren't elementals just because uh, I need them. So I got uh, Birds of Paradise and Paradise Druid in there as well. Oh, nice. And um I mean you could run like land ramp obviously, but um mm. I'm not because my deck is also a or the Collector Companion deck. Oh, awesome. So you have all creatures. Yeah. Sweet. So Which gives a, it, it does give a discount mm -hmm. to my creatures, so that's a, consider that something as well in the terms of... So Umori the Collector companion. reduces... So is a companion. Companion means that it's uh, it starts off in a separate part of the exile zone, and... For three generic mana, you can put it into your hand at sorcery speed. And yeah. then you can cast it. Uh, when it's out, it's a 4-5, I believe, because I, I have a deck where it's the commander. And then oh, you cool. name a type. And the type that you would choose is creature because your deck is all creatures, because that's the condition that it has to meet in order to be your companion. Uh, yeah. And companions in Commander have a particular difficulty because uh, they have to uh, your commit your companion or your commander has to also meet the companion requirement. Yeah. So I believe there's only two things that could be if it's your companion. It's either enchantment with Farika or uh, well enchantment with Farika. I think Cruff uh, can Cruffix do it. I think Cruffix can do it. Um, or... I don't think so, because Mori is uh, Golgari colors. Oh, yeah, okay. It has to be in color identity and uh, type. Yeah, so the only one that can do that is Farika. So it's either Farika enchant enchantments, or uh, it, it can be any green or any commander with green, black, and the identity, uh, That's a, and all creatures. So in this case, you can't run things that are, like, Instant sorceries, enchantments, because you can only run creatures and lands. Yeah. Uh, my thinking was that like the evoke creatures are almost like instants and sorceries themselves, the way they have their own abilities. Mm -hmm. So that's for, that they kind of fill that role in the deck instead of the traditional ones. Yep, the only thing that could be an issue is timing. And that's actually where some of the yeah. new uh, evoke creatures come in. It's a flash. Uh, yeah, because there was a cycle, I believe, one in each color, of oh, yeah. pitch evoke, evoke creatures with flash. And there are a couple of other evoke creatures that have flash, because I think I remember there being like a giant growth uh, that had flash. Uh, that I've played yeah. before. Yeah, uh, Briarhorn. Yep. Oh, actually, there might be two of them. Oh, yeah? Um, I think there was a functional reprint. I'll try to remember it, but... Yeah, uh, so one of the really nice things that Modern Horizons 2 brought was a lot more evoke creatures. Mm, yeah, I was really excited about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's Briarhorn. I thought there was another one, but I can't remember right now. But uh, Foundation Breaker is another nice one that came out. Yes. To naturalize on a stick, although it is sorcery speed. So... Are there some cards in your deck that can help get around that sorcery speed? Yeah, I've got, like, the Flash 
all the tools you were just talking about that you broke, uh, like um, uh, subtlety, which uh, yeah, bounces the a spell. Blue. Nice. Like, for playbook spell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that flash beat. It's good. Uh, Solitude is a really good one. Possibly the most expensive of the. So Solitude, what does that one do? It's uh when there's a battlefield exile up to one other target creature and it's controlled against life equal to its power. So it's basically source of power shares on a body. Nice. So we're speaking of uh, Sultai creatures that were elementals. Uh, yeah. Is Moldrotha in there? Moldrotha the Grave Tide. Uh, not on my list because I only have creatures, so it doesn't get that value. Yeah, when you do get lands and you lands and creatures, um, technically, uh, and I'm not sure if you have any like elemental or not elemental, but uh, you have tons of elementals, but any like enchantment creatures or artifact creatures would work as well. Just having an uh, incidental type. Well, I mean, I have a Corathopter of Paradise, which is an artifact creature, but I don't really see much in the way of enchantment or artifact creatures otherwise. Okay. Um. I was just thinking about that as a way to get additional value because you can only activate your commander so many times a turn, I think. Yeah. Plus, I believe, uh, let's see, can you evoke it from a place of yeah, Evoke doesn't care about where it was cast. No. So you can evoke a creature from the grave and put it right back there. If something says that you can cast it. So that might be an interesting thing to consider. Just... Any ways that you can specifically cast creatures from other places? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I'll see if I can make room in the deck for that. Uh, Vizier the Menagerie could also be a cool one. Mm. That one I'm not familiar with. Uh, that one is from Aiming Cats. Um, you may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast creature spells from the top of your library. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast creature spells. Ooh. So it fixes your mana, uh, gives you additional card draw because you can cast off the top, and it doesn't matter what way that you are casting it. So that's another way that you can evoke creatures off of the top of your library. So just cool things to consider. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> some, some unusual interactions as well. It's always, it's always fun to be able to mess with things and break the rules. <laughs> that's yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, as an Isix and as an is it and Quandrix player, I'm always mm. looking to break rules. So, what are some of the things that drew you to elementals as a creature type? Well, partly it is just their uh, value, the way they just have these all these different abilities. Um, I'm also drawn to the fact that a lot of them. Well, I'm not sure you say a lot, but. They all have, um, all have subtypes that are uh, animalistic. You have like Frost Thinks, which is an elemental cat, Fake uh, and Crash, which is an elemental rhino, and so on, which, given their elemental um, properties, it almost makes them sort of uh, Pokemon esque in a way. Yeah, especially like how quite a lot of them have like monosyllabic names, like Spikello yeah. and. It almost sounds like a Pokemon name. Mm -hmm. And the ability to just come out, do a hit, give a hit, and then go back, it's kind of like... Um, so there's a Pokemon that was made with that ability recently that's a rock and bug type, I think. Oh, well, yeah? I don't remember exactly what it was, but it, it basically, when it, when it takes damage, it, it leaves, I think. Well, I was going to say that when I first started playing Commander, like, my... The second deck I got after I bought a pre-con, like, and made my own deck, was a uh, Omnath Locus of Rage deck, which I originally built as a Gruel Elementals deck, like, before I got turned on to Landfall stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, I played that deck for quite a while, but then decided that I had other decks are more interested in, in the terms of, like, tokens and big stuff, I want to make an elemental value deck, and I built this Horde of Notions deck, which I still need to put into paper, but I'm quite excited for it. Yeah, and, and that happens, but it's awesome to see how 
you can take a deck idea and then split it up into two really cool decks. Yeah. That happened recently with my Locust God deck. I made it into oh, yeah. Locust Pocus, which was a polymorph deck. But mm-hmm. people just saw Locust God and didn't like it, and so I split it up into three Oathbreaker decks. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, it's always cool when you can take a deck that you're not really that... Or take a deck where you pulled in a few different directions with it and just mm-hmm. split it. Uh, another thing I did with that recently was... Uh, I had a, this is more, I just brainstormed and got a bunch of similar cards together. So I wanted to make a Roshin Meanderer deck, and ultimately made, I just decided I had so many red cards I wanted to play that I just made a Fireball Tribal deck, oh. and then made Roshin separately that was Hydra Tribal. So instead of a Roshin that was Hydras and Fireballs, it became... A mono red fireball deck and a Roshin Hydra deck. I saw your post about your Roshin deck. <laughs> oh yeah, that that was a silly game. Uh, this is a card that allows you to uh, it's X X green, um, and then you double the creature's power X times. Oh nice. So I uh, doubled it three times. Mm. Went uh, and did thirty two commander damage in one swing. I was I was not expecting to win with commander damage with with a hydra deck, but it happens. Yeah. I thought he was just a mana dork. But four powers a lot. Oh yeah. So speaking of power and game ending ability, how do elementals tend to end the game? Uh, elementals has some big hitters in like uh, Adventure of Zendikar's an elemental. Oh yeah. That is a staple. Um, so if we do bring right. in the Shia, that turns every creature you play into an extra land drop, including if you evoke it, because it still comes out long enough to get the ability. So that pumps all your land, all your tokens. Awesome. Uh, here, sure is here. Uh, Thicket Crasher, which gives uh, all the elementals trample. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm running a Tribal Force Mage, which uh, is a morph that when it's turned up, creature of the type of your choice gets plus two, plus two, and gain trample to that turn. Well, that's always good. Plus, you know, uh, the morph always has to be Willbender, right? Uh, yeah. You are in blue. Yeah, for the most part, it is a uh, outvalue my opponent's type of deck. But, oh, yeah, yeah, games do have to end. Yeah, kind of like what I, <laughs> what I did with the... Uh... Uh, with the block constructed, where it's just, okay, I'm getting all this value out of my ETB effects, eventually, you know, I'm going to have a full hand, you'll have an empty board, and I'll just bash in for some. Or maybe not an empty board, but as empty as we can make it. I wonder if Horde of Notions uh, commander damage could just get there. It's well, already pretty I, beefy, right? Yeah, it's a 5-5. Five, five. Mm-hmm. It's a 5-5, five, five. there's some lords in there, you said, you can give it trample. Yeah. Good amount of mana fixing and ramp, so yeah, that that sounds like a pretty legit way to try to do it. Oh yeah. So, what are, what's some of your personal history with the tribe? You mentioned that you like uh, how they're Pokemon like, uh, how they have under the battlefield effects for value. But is there do you have uh, is there any personal reason for the story or for the tribe or? Any history you have with them? Not really. Like, my first experience with them was attempting a rural elementals deck. Yeah, I, I never played with them before then. Okay. Like, I, like just... I didn't play that much magic, like, before. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they, I, I just connected with them, like, almost right away once I found out about them. Uh We've been interested in things like the like different versions of the elements, like uh, maybe Avatar: Last Airbender or anything like that. Oh yeah, I, yeah, I have the Avatar uh, on DVD, the full series. Oh awesome! Does so I take it that you yeah. enjoyed it? Oh yeah, it was great. Uh, does Korra hold the same esteem or a little bit different? Sorry, you cut out there for me. Uh, does Korra hold the same esteem or a little bit different? 
I haven't seen Korra, just the original. Uh -oh. I've heard mixed things about Korra. I'm not sure when I'm going to get around to actually watching it. Um, it's got its moments, I can tell you that. Okay. But the original is still the original. <laughs> and it always will be. Uh, really, Korra has interesting action sequences, has good development of characters, but it, it's a different show that's for a different audience. Okay. That's, that's kind of the, the best I can tell you about it, is that it, it looks like it was designed for the same audience, but years later, or just a different audience. I see. So it's, like, for a older group, then? Yeah, like there's much okay. less, yeah, like there's much less humor. The humor okay. that's there doesn't hit the same way. It's a lot more serious and talk and looking at the implications of actions and such, more of the world building and such. So, okay. and you can tell that just from the fact that the character is or the main character is older. This is going to be a more mature show. Granted, the original yeah. was very mature and had and really mature themes and, and subjects, but Korra was just designed to be mature. Mm. In some cases, you might say it's a little bit edgelord-like. Okay, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Well, that, that's really leaning too far the other direction, but it also is looking at the character from a different point in development as the Avatar. So there's different growth that the character requires. So it's a different show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all right. I very much enjoyed Avatar as well, and I actually made a D and D three point five adventure based on it. Ooh, that sounds awesome. That was that was a cool one. That was based on uh, it's set when Aang was still frozen, because. Mm. The world didn't really know what happened to him. They thought that he died, really, or that he disappeared for whatever reason. So people were still looking for either him or for the next one. Really, okay. they believed that it, they were looking for the next avatar in the stage. They thought that he was dead. That's why Zuko okay. was in was by the water tribe. Right, because the water is after air. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the cycle. Yeah. So... In this, the player characters would be going to try to find the new avatar, and they would have to be. They would be assigned a White Lotus member who would be an NPC, who would be walking them around or taking them around to the different uh, places in the in the Water Tribe, and they would have to try to find who. Um, well, the, the player characters know that they're not going to find the avatar, but. The interesting thing to do in terms of intrigue is to try to deduce each other's motives and try to uh, deduce uh, and try to trick and trap the people who are going there for the wrong reasons. Like uh, one time I ran it and there was uh, one of the NPCs was an evil NPC who was trying to kill the Avatar ah. as a baby before they could run, before they could get all their powers. And break the cycle that way. So the player characters trick them by pretending as though the the item that the baby picked out was the right one, and then staking them out, staking out and waiting for them to try to kill the baby. Oh well. Wow. Love to run it again sometime, but that was a fun one. So were elementals the first deck that you built, or did you build others before that? I. There were, that was the first deck I built, like, from scratch. I had bought the uh, Wizards Precon prior, but, like, pretty shortly before. Awesome. So, how did you get the elemental cards? Quite a few of them I actually found in, like, my uh, LGS's bulk rare oh, nice. bin. I was looking through there. Always a good place to look, because you never know what gems you're going to find or things that are going to be undervalued. Yeah. Uh, like, especially because LGSs are notoriously bad at organizing cards by the set. They mm -hmm. usually just organize it by rarity or by, uh, by the most recently printed version. Uh, like, I managed to find... Um, 
I think it was the old border of Pyroclasm after Pyroclasm was reprinted. And so the old border was worth like $2, but I found it in the 50 cent bin because the newest versions were only worth 50 cents. So yeah, sometimes you manage to find some gems like that, and sometimes you can just build a deck out of them. Oh, yeah. So when you were flipping through those cards, did you did, did they, like, stand out to you, or did you just, like, notice the type over and over again? Um, they stood out to me individually at first. Uh, it was until later when I, like, found uh, cards like Creeping Trailblazer has elemental synergy with it, and then Omnath himself, mm -hmm. which made the elemental notes where I found I had all these creatures that were elementals. So yeah, if you are a new deck builder, it's always a good idea to start with a tribal deck because a lot of the synergies just happen to exist because they were designed to have synergies. Mm. So if you're still learning how to evaluate cards or how to... Uh, Put a deck together. It's always good to start with a tribal deck because there's going to be some sort of an identity there. Sometimes you have to make the identity, but in most cases the identity already exists. Yeah. So like with my with my Hydra deck, I didn't have to look that hard because they all have X on the cost. And mm -hmm. even though the commander isn't a Hydra, the commander uses uh, taps for mana for X uh, to help with the X. For are Horde there, of... What's that? I was asking, are there red Hydras? Are there are red? a couple, but mostly the Hydras that I have in there are red and green. Okay, that's cool. But I also have other effects that are red X spells in there. Yeah, there, uh, there are a couple, like Stone Hydra, I think, is an older one. Stone and Rock Hydra, I think, are, are the, the two that were originally printed in red. In fact, they were in red before they were in green. But... I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm still in my burst of trying to make simple decks that do one thing. So I don't want to have cards on there that have like several different abilities. It's interesting to put those uh, kind of limitations on yourself for deck building. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm also putting limitations on myself as a player because I'm, I know that during the week I'm kind of tired, but I also... Um, I'm looking to be more present in games. Because that's, that's, right. that's something where we talk about all the synergies that elementals have and all of the like chain reaction with Yarok and stuff, but you want to make sure that you're still reading your cards and understanding them well enough. That's where having an all-creature deck can, can actually help. Because it is imposing a limitation on yourself, but it's also getting you to understand things like timing and to understand patience and relevance to the board, and also to factor in some of those things like the importance of being able to give flash to things. Like maybe Yeva might be a good idea in there because it gives flash to all green creatures, and the board happens to be a green creature. So that um, just little things like that where you can get around your own limitation or find ways to turn your limitation into an advantage. You know that you're not going to run out of creatures anytime soon, so you don't have to be as concerned about board wipes. But you do need to... Uh, and you can also sort of F6 through other people's turns, and at least until a combat step, because you're not going to be able to do much about it anyways if you're not playing some of those flash effects. So that's a nice thing, to be able to sit back and just watch other people play their turns as opposed to sitting back with removal and waiting for things. An example of that would be, like, when I'm playing Scrabble with my mom, she always says, uh, Oh, you took my place! Well, should have had more than one place, I guess. <laughs> my mom's like that, too. Yeah, just those sorts of things where you, you have a flexible plan and you can attack from different angles. So it's, it's always a nice thing to be able to do. Is there anything else you'd like to say about elementals? Sure, there's a couple more elementals I want to uh, highlight. Absolutely. Um, uh, Whisperboard Elemental, which uh, manifests your uh, top card of your library at each end step. Well, it's your end steps, actually, not everyone. But because mm -hmm. every creature in your... Well, every 
card in my deck is either a land or a creature, it's going to be not going to like whiff the manifest in that sense of hitting like a spell that I don't want it to. Uh. So, yeah, you're always going to be able to use it. You don't have to do things uh, like... Um, I know some decks that have manifests will play like erratic portal to be able to put it back in their hand so they can still cast it, but you don't have to go through those kind of hoops because you know it's a creature. And, uh, it, does, also, uh, um, it does get around the... Uh, I don't know, the battlefield effect, though, which which can hurt a little bit. It can hurt, yeah. You can always do the peekaboo of... I attack you with the tutu. Is it a land or is it a creature that I want to die so I can bring it back? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another one is uh, Gigant of the Wellspring. The elemental, which I'm writing yeah. in the deck. Oh. It could be another companion. It, I'm just using it in the deck. Yeah, the, part uh, that it, do, the only part that doesn't make sense about it to me is that it's an elk that can get elked. <laughs> because Oko can turn it into an elk. It's already an elk. <laughs> uh, but it taps for Ruberg, and so it can be used to get an extra activation out for Notion's ability. It's for what will activation itself. Yeah, that is, that is nice, and it, and it pays for the initial cast if you, if yeah. you so choose. Now, do you have double costs in there? Yeah, a, top, a few. I've been trying to avoid triple costs. So I don't have like cloud flusher. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I do have tired of discard versus a triple cost. So my, question, so my question is, I wonder, uh, is it worth having Umori as a companion, or would Giganta be better? Um, that's a good question. Either one would work. They both happen to be elementals. <laughs> yeah, either would work. I, I mean, I just like Umori. Yeah. And, and they, uh, yeah, they I, happen I, to work nicely together because Umori makes Giganta cost less. Yeah. yeah. It's actually an interesting thing where Giganta can float the mana, and if you have a way, so like if Giganta would die, you can float the mana and then use the mana to return Giganta. Hmm. This yeah. is an interesting way to go about it. <laughs> Some very helpful tips for this deck. Oh, always, always weird stuff. <laughs> there's there's well, always uh, weird, I, cool interactions that can happen. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out how you spell a shy, though. Oh, A S H A Y A. Ah, thank you. Absolutely. I think that's all I have to say about them. Awesome. Any more questions? Oh, um, so that's good for this episode. So. This has been J. Rowe, the Unsummoned Skull, along with... J.J. Mickey. And where can they find Thank you? you so much. At uh, Twitter, at J.J. Mickey Media, and uh, on TikTok at J.J. Mickey Media, with underscores between each word. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being on. And uh, look forward to having you on again sometime. Yeah, of course. All right. Have a good one.